Hi everyone and welcome to the next edition of the Hidden London Hangout. My name's Alex and it's a great pleasure to be talking you through another one of our tours into the hidden parts of our wonderful capital. I don't do this on my own, I've got a team of amazing people to do this with me. First of all, Chris Nix from the London Transport Museum. How's your day going, Chris? Good so far, thank you, Alex. Yes, uh, very Lovely good stuff. Here. And a very nice cup you've got there as well. City Holloway, you're illuminated in your roundel. Yes, uh, hello, nice to see you again, Alex. Here's my hidden London roundel sitting proudly next to me. More on that in just a second. And Laura Hilton-Brown, obviously your lamp that I adore and covet every week. It's still there, my lovely. Still there, still the same little setup. How are you? I am good, thank you very much. Excellent. And I'm delighted to say we've got royalty of sorts on our Hidden London Hangout because um, I can introduce you to an OBE because Sam, the big boss man of the London Transport Museum, is on the line as well. Sam Mullen, OBE. Hello. Well, hello. I'm not sure whether I've been invited to join Love Island or the Archers here, but it, <laughs> I'm, I'm deeply honoured whichever way it is. To carry on Tube Station, I think, most weeks, but it's marvellous. <laughs> I've actually got a job for you, Sam, to be honest, because um, I had something arrive which completes the set, really, so we're all a bit more well-dressed. Um, I've got my roundel in the post. And I just wondered whether you might do the grand switch on. Would you do a couple of little words for me just before I throw the big switch? <laughs> well, unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, um, <laughs> I'm delighted, Alex, that you've finally given in to persuasion, bought yourself an illuminated roundel from the excellent London Transport Museum shop. Um, and uh, I'd like now to formally declare the Alex roundel open and illuminated. I love this, and look at that, I even got the switch. And there it is. Thank you very much, everybody. It's marvellous. If I could have done this any other way, I wouldn't have done. That was perfect. Thank you very much indeed, Sam. Today, we are talking about Down Street. This is a station which is so stunning. When I go down there, I get total goosebumps. I am a tube geek. I'm a tile fanatic. And I love anywhere that's not meant to be visited. I love going there. And today we're going to have a little look around the place. To give you an idea of where it is, it's between Green Park and Hyde Park Corner on the Piccadilly Line. And it is a station with an awful lot of history. Chris Nix, first of all. Chris, just give us a potted history of the place. Sure. So Down Street was on the Piccadilly Line. It was one of the Edwardian uh, expansion uh, stations. And uh, it was um, surface requirements fairly early on in its life. It was very close to its two neighbouring stations. It sat in a sleepy, wealthy back street, not really serving uh, anywhere particularly. And so not many people used it or indeed saw it. Um, quite a beautiful station nonetheless, uh, as all of those Piccadilly Line stations like Old Witch and Covent Garden are. Uh, fabulously tiled, very, very well designed, um, but just tucked away. And therefore, as a station, it wasn't a success. And by the time it's two neighbouring stations, Green Park, originally called Dover Street, and Hyde Park Corner, uh, were both converted from having lifts to having escalators. That had the effect of moving the entrances uh, for the escalators uh, closer to Down Street. And that really did mean that by the 30s, it was surplus to requirement. And in 1932, it closed. Um, its platforms were shortened. Uh, a crossover and siding was built in there. And its lifts were removed to allow it to become a much needed ventilation shaft for the Piccadilly line. That could have been it. That could have been the end of it. It wasn't a successful station. Uh, and those uh, hundreds of metres of uh, extra corridor below ground just off Piccadilly could have spent the rest of their life being a ventilation shaft. However, of course, war was breaking out in Europe. And in the Spanish Civil War, uh, Europe had learned what would happen in modern warfare when aerial bombardment brought high explosive and incendiaries into a modern city. And the answer is it destroyed it very quickly. Um, and so the Railway Executive Committee uh, was formed in the run-up to, uh, to the Second World War, just as they had been in the First World War, to run the nation's railways, which were privately owned, as if they were publicly owned. And that was vital because these were the arteries uh, of the nation's logistics supply. And without them, couldn't have won the war uh, just simply on logistic grounds. 
Um, and they needed a place uh, to be safe where they could put a really, really important instrument, the telephone, and a skeleton crew of staff to be able to coordinate the railways, whatever happened from above, be it explosive, incendiary, or the big fear, of course, gas attack. Um, and that is where Downstreet comes in as being a quiet, forgotten, large amount of safe, safe below ground and right for conversion into the state of the art bunker that it became. I, it fascinates me that we talk about Downstreet as being a station that wasn't really that well used because it was right in the middle of Mayfair, a posh bit of London. Sam, just give us, paint us a little picture of what life was like for the folk of Mayfair during World War II. Well, of course, the, during the early part of, uh, of the, the phony war, it was strangely normal and people went, you know, did their shopping in Shepherd Market or on Piccadilly or, uh, but when the, when, the, when the Blitz started uh, in earnest uh, in 1940, uh, life, was, life, was, life was transformed and uh, uh, shops were di disappeared overnight. People would get up in the morning to find the streets covered in glass, full of firemen's hoses, buildings that were there the day before, a heap of, a heap of smoking rubble. So it's a, you know, we get really excited about all these disused spaces you know below the ground um i think it's really important just to remember that it was literally kind of hell on earth on the surface which is why people needed to you know get down below the ground and what you know it, it, it fascinates me actually when you talk about your paint there's such vivid pictures of hose pipes all over the road and the broken glass and everything else and it, it, you're absolutely right because it was perilous being in london wasn't it at the time Meanwhile, down underground at Down Street, it was a very, very different experience. And Laura, we've all been down there, but for you, you're our eyes and ears on these things usually. You paint the pictures of what life is like for, for me and you, not the historian Sidney and uh, Chris. So if I went down there now, what would I see? Do you know what, Alex? Down Street's fabulous. It literally is a, um, a time capsule. It's a gem of a venue for us to work with. Um, I mean, it's a top secret venue. It was used during the war by the REC. And each of our venues have something a little bit different, a little bit unique about them. Um, each one is intriguing as the other. But what each venue has is just something, uh, something that kind of appeals to a, to a kind of like a different part of, um, of history and social history, engineering, planning, design. And for me, Down Street is about investigation, discovery. It's about refuge, but it's different to Clapham South, which we were talking about last week. Clapham is refuge and sheltering from a civilian point of view, whereas Down Street is refuge and work for the workforce that were keeping London moving during the war. I mean, the, I think it was a, a workforce about 40. I don't, uh, if that's wrong, please, please let me know, Chris or Siddy. Um, that's right. but there, were, there were a team down there they ate down there, they slept down there, they worked down there. So you go down this amazing spiral staircase and you have dormitories and you have a kitchen and you have a boardroom and you have committee room. And what we're trying to do for the public is um, kind of pick out that complex layout and really replicate the day-to-day -day life for the people that were down there. And even though it was basic, it was comfortable, um, but what they've done is they used every single inch of that space so very meticulously. And what I love about the tour is that we can see all those different rooms and take you in and tell you stories and it all unfolds as soon as you walk down the stairs and you realise that you've entered a typing pool. Then you go to the committee room and the guides bring to life such a phenomenal story about where cu crucial, vital decisions are made um, for the war efforts. I, what I love about the building is when you, as soon as you go in the door, you are struck by the paint on the walls. The very first thing you see, mm. and if you know anything about railways, if you know anything about trains, you'll go, I know that, I recognize those colors. And it turns out that the, even the paint on the wall was put there by the firm, the railway company that decked it out. And it was a depot near Milton Keynes, before Milton Keynes was even built as a, as a town. It is the most phenomenal, intricate detail. And I reckon if we 
ask Siddy very nicely to bring out her Siddy's slideshow. Of we course. might actually just get a little sneaky peek down there. There we have it, Down Street Station. A Leslie uh, Green gem. A Leslie Green gem indeed, and, and kind of unusual, you know, because you see the, the font that's on the, that, that's displaying the station name. It took us a while to find, figure out that that was actually used by quite a lot of early Leslie Green stations. Uh, it was gilded. They were in beautiful kind of gilded letters. So it says Down Street Station there. Um, and of course, as we, as we know, located in Down Street in Mayfair. You can just about sort of see the surroundings there. And that is in June 1907, just a few months after the station opened. Now, when you go there today, just the kind of entry bay where it says lift exit, where you, if you're looking at it, that's, it's all been bricked up. And that's how you enter into the station today. And as you enter, this is where you start coming down. I love it's, this. This is just so joyous to see this stuff. It's creepy and fabulous and a bit dirty. But yeah, and, and you can sort of see little scratches of that paint that you were talking about there. Yeah. We'll see more of that in just a minute. Now, that's the spiral oh, stairs. Look at that. <laughs> and you see, one of the things we always say to people uh, when we stand on that staircase and we point them to that signage which says to street, everyone goes, well, I mean, obviously, you know, up is to the street, but you know, you never know what kind of state of people would be in, if they'd be disorientated or whatnot. So they put these kind of to street let, well, signage uh, all over the, all over the facility down there so and these and these people who query this city are they the same person who walk up to fire exits and say why is it called a fire exit <laughs> because um, you can, you i'll get say confused. no comment to that exactly <laughs> um so uh, another bit of in, incredibly important signage is stuff that you start reading on the walls so you see that that's just something that's literally been painted onto the wall and you see that yellow paint and then just faintly in the yellow paint you see arrows pointing you to different parts of the station and these would be different uh, offices and different areas within the, the complex that was built so you see there's something that just at the end there it says number 27 that's referring to office number 27 which was the operating control room so it's just a little hint at what used to uh what what was there before and i love the i love the do you think that writing was done by hand or was it stencil what do you think oh all done by hand because when wow. you come up real close to it you see the pencil marks still in in uh, on the walls so literally still there sensational um, and of course, you've got that lovely yellow as well, that lovely yellow paint. That lovely sort of mustard, mustard yeah. yellow. Um, well, we have thought, we, you see this yellow quite kind of extensively, particularly with wartime structures. What we think it's a, it's a way to kind of try and brighten up the space to make you forget that you're underground. Um, but also, I'm assuming it may have been a, a leftover or something, maybe, maybe that lovely mustard coloured wasn't, wasn't so popular in uh, 1939 or, or just before. Am so, I right in saying, Chris, um, that the paint used on the walls was actually the railway company's paint livery that they used to paint the trains in? Yeah, when you get down to the very bottom of the spiral stairs, about another twist of the stairs from where this is taken, uh, the, the walls are an unmistakable, unmistakable chocolate and cream. Uh, mm -hmm. which was the Great Western color, uh, colours. Uh, so yeah, given that Great Western were, were one of the four big mainland railway companies down there, um, yeah, it looks like they're using up their spare paint. Love it, I love it. Uh, now the next one is just to give everyone a little bit of an idea of what lies beneath, on, on, well, beneath the street or what Down Street Station's layout is. Just and look at that at the top corner, Great Northern Piccadilly and Brompton Railway, GNP and B and RLY. I love yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. The original name for the line, we now obviously just call it the Piccadilly Line, uh, quite, quite a bit simpler than the, the GNPBR Railway. <laughs> um, now, so you see the layout of the station. So uh, actually the station was quite unusual in that it opened late it opened a few months after the rest of the line. 
um, they had these two really long corridors connecting to the platforms which lie beneath Piccadilly itself, the, the street. So uh, when the station closed in 32, um, these long corridors were ideal to be used as, as a ventilation shaft, but later on also ideal to use to convert into a secret government bunker because you had so much real estate underground, just those long corridors there. Now, here you start seeing a little bit about uh, of how the Railway Executive Committee actually converted this tube station into, uh, into offices. So you see some of the parts of the offices there. Chris, do you want to talk us a little bit through what we're looking at? Yeah, um, this, uh, this shows the first corridor at the bottom of the stairs and how they were dividing up uh, a large passenger tunnel into uh, several individual offices, the large committee meeting room for all of the directors of the main railway companies, uh, and also a little bit about the plant that is ventilating the site. This, this corridor shown here in pink is, uh, is from a drawing that's in our collection, uh, in the museum's collection. It's an early drawing, it's plan number four, um, I believe it's plan number six was the one that was actually built, but this is remarkably close to the finished article. And it's important to realise that that corridor is over 22 metres below ground, which mm. is why it was such a great place to build the defended working uh, headquarters. But also, Irish. Chris, you know, you, you, although you, it's 22 metres below ground, it's still only a narrow passenger tunnel, and yet they turned it into offices. I mean, this is quite snug, isn't it? It is, but as Laura said before, it, it's, it, it's done with an almost nautical approach to, uh, to laying things out. Everything in its place, a place for everything. Uh, and the people who fitted it out uh, were the London, Midland and Scottish Railways uh, carriage works uh, people. So they were used to doing this kind of stuff in even more confined spaces. Amazing. So there we see, see parts of the platform and actually we're looking at, uh, at the top left corner, uh, you're looking at the mess rooms, the officers mess room, the executive mess room, in, in fact, and the regular officers mess room. Um, and you just see like every inch of space is being used. But Chris talked earlier about the importance of the telephone and that was really what they were doing down there is that the, in order to run the nation's railways, the most important thing in 1939 was to be able to have effective telephone uh, communications. And so that's really what the facility was all about. Oh, look at that. And you can still see, look at the bend of the tunnel. You can yeah. actually see it in the wall. Exactly, yeah. So this is just built literally on the platform. So the, the wall that's behind that lady's back is a is a is a what well, is a single skin brick wall and the running of the of the piccadilly line is still just behind so imagine you're trying to be all secretive and saying like i'm speaking to you from an undisclosed location and then the piccadilly line just rumbles past it's like <clears throat> uh, <laughs> it's it's mind-blowing to think that was all going on in an old disused tube station exactly it's something that you almost think is that you know something that we've made up but we certainly haven't because this is what remains oh look even the old tiles look yeah. at that so you've still somebody's done us a great favor and kind of cleaned the way out cartouche for us but you also see that is the uh the the telephone exchange itself the switchboard is still down there after oh come on years. city get your duster out honestly <laughs> It's filthy. It's historical dust. It's historical <laughs> dust. <laughs> it's honestly, City, those pictures are sensational. They're great, Absolutely aren't they? Absolutely sensational. No. Are we done for this? Uh... <gasps> no, we're not. Done. It still keeps coming. I know. Sorry, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief on these ones. But this, this is the uh, executive mess room at, at Down Street Station. Uh, you've got a steward there in full livery. You've got Gonzalez Bayer sherry on the tables and beautiful glassware all of which supplied by the railway hotels of London. So this wasn't coming out of the public's pocket, it was coming out of private railway companies' pockets. So we can at least feel good about that. Now this is what it looks like today. Oh my goodness. Where's the table gone? Where's the sherry? I know, well, unfortunately we can't serve you any sherry down there, but what you can do is go to the London Transport Museum and in our Hidden London exhibition, when we reopen, 
you can go and sit down uh, at the, in the executive mess room, which we have recreated for that exhibition. I'll bring my now, own sherry. Lastly, I just want to show some of the gentlemen who are in the Railway Executive Committee. There they are sitting in a, a very snug committee room that occupied the entire width of the corridor. And to end on, uh, just to give people a sense of how close the railway really is to the, the offices. That corridor just, but just to, uh, to the right is where the offices and the, and the dormitories are in fact. And that's where the, to the left is where the trains run. So if I just do that, that's essentially what it looked like. And that's somebody boarding a train from the premises of Down Street back in. Now I love this. While you've got that photograph up, Siddy, just stay there one second, because I just want to bring in Chris. This picture here, okay, the train has stopped and there is an extra signal on the wall there that's lit. Tell me why, what's that doing there? So this was a very simple and elegant way to secretly get staff in and out of the site without them breaking cover at the surface. Uh, out of the shop, there is a plunger switch which would turn that light on. Uh, it was a red light. Red light to drivers means stop, which is what this driver has done. And the executives could then board uh, the cab and travel to the neighbouring station, in this case, uh, High Park Corner, uh, and either disembark there or carry on to interchange at another station. When they wanted to do the reverse and come into the site, they had to have one of these. Uh, oh, which was um, your ID card, um, which allowed you to uh, show that to the driver and uh, the driver would admit you into the cab and then they would drop you off at that very short piece of platform that they kept in the station uh, so that you could go into, into the uh, railway executive facility. So um, show me that again, because that, that, that was the early day Oyster card, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, there you go. So, wow! Um, that that would have admitted you uh, on either the east or the westbound, so you could come at the, the, there was a platform on both sides in Down Street, so you could come in either direction. It's a very clever, very clever mechanism. So, so this, if we, we're painting our little pictures of this amazing, uh, this amazing setup. We have um, a pass that you can show to get your own train to stop. And the civil servants and the big, bigwigs who were down there, living there, if you like, had quite a lavish lifestyle, didn't they, Chris? They did. Um, uh, it was it was one that was a contrast with uh, civilian life, which I, I think we'll get Sam to tell us a little bit more about in that that area at the time. Um, and I I think the um, the although there appears to be a big contrast between the two, you have to remember that these people were working round the clock. And in any form of bunker or shelter, uh, morale uh, is really one of the key things to keep up. So it appears lavish, uh, and by contrast with what Sam will uh, tell us about the horrors at the surface, um, yeah, it, it was lavish. It's something you should you bring in that, because knowing Sam as we do, Sam is, he's a bookworm, Sam is a proper bookworm, as you can see from where he's sitting now. And you, you were saying, Sam, before, that, um, the parks around Mayfair, Hyde Park, Green Park, had almost developed a world of their own, didn't they, during World War II? The, the public were using them in ways that you perhaps wouldn't expect. Well, they did initially. Um, there's a really kind of graphic account um, of someone who used it every day, and then they realised that when they went out in the morning, it was covered in shrapnel, from mostly from anti-aircraft guns, and gradually the park becomes becomes kind of part of the you know part of the war effort and people ebb away and the man who normally you know hires out the deck chairs eventually gives up and disappears and Hyde Park itself became a huge dump for furniture and materials from bombed out sites and uh, even even had allotments where people could start to grow their own vegetables uh, in it. Um, Fertile soil then yeah? Uh, well, I guess so, yeah. Um, I've got this really nice account here, Alex, of living near Down Street. Would you like me to read out a bit from it? Uh, yes, please. Um, this was written by someone called Madeline Henry, who lived in Shepherd's Market, which is just yeah, up the road from Down Street and turn right. And she lived there uh, throughout the war with her, uh, her baby and her Pekingese. Um, and she says, um, this is November 1940. 
and she published this book called uh, A Village in Piccadilly uh, in 1942. And she became actually a terribly successful kind of popular autobiographer uh, in the 1950s. Uh, just before two o'clock in the morning, we were awakened by the sound of an explosion a few streets away, followed by another much nearer. We held our breaths expecting a third, because that's how they so often seem to fall, nearer and nearer. It came screeching down, finishing up with a crisp, angry, tearing punch, accompanied by a blinding flash as the building rocked and everything in the room crashed about our heads. There was a suffocating stench, a moment's complete silence, and then an imperative voice from somewhere in the night. We made a dive for the cot, found the baby intact, still asleep, and proceeded to assess the damage. It wasn't possible to strike a light because our windows were gaping open with the curtains wrenched off. But by a miracle, the glass wasn't broken because the air hadn't been able to rush in. In the adjoining room where the windows had been closed, all of them were smashed and the glass pounded to shreds and driven like nails into the opposite walls. Myriads of sharp pieces were embedded in the plaster. The Pekingese was wailing and the chairs had been torn to pieces with their legs thrown in all directions so that we're continually tripping up over broken objects on our way to the kitchen. I just think it's remarkable that the, the pictures being painted of the hell on earth on, on ground level are completely at odds with drinking sherry down on platform level. It is the most bizarre thing. But I guess, Chris, the point of this was that they were, they were looking after the civil servants who were running the country effectively. So they had to look after them and give them somewhere comfortable, warm and give them, give them plenty of food and drink, I suppose. Well, that's it. I mean, the photo that Sydney showed you earlier with the two telephone operatives, at that time, they were working 12-hour shifts doing that. And if you look at the state of their eyes, you know, the bags underneath their eyes uh, at that point, they, they had to stay down there. They, as, as Laura said, you know, they were sleeping down there. There was no, you know, you had to get shore leave. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't always go home at, home at night. So it was hard and arduous. And the key thing that's worth remembering is that we talked about Clapham South last week and how that was designed to be a really hardened, deep shelter to save civilians. Um, it seems to have been modelled a full degree on those uh, those features at Down Street, the, the, the depth, the safety, the, the availability of food and drink to keep morale up. So it does seem that government um, did share that, that out as the war went on. Well, I'd still quite fancy a, a sherry right now, actually, but um, <laughs> we're, we're business time. I better stick to me water. But um, Siddy, um, I loved your pictures last time. We always try and do a secret slideshow, perhaps pictures mm -hmm. that you wouldn't necessarily see uh, in books or anything else. Siddy, what you got for me? Actually, while Sydney's just loading that up, um, the, one of the things that we, we do find with audiences when we, uh, when we take them around the site is that people really do love those, those stories of the minutiae of how people live. And although we can't let people uh, have uh, food and drink while we go around uh, what is, uh, you know, what is a, a semi-derelict site, uh, Laura does have a way for people be, to be able to enjoy that as part of their experience. Laura? Yeah, we do, Chris. Well, I mean, what would be lovely is if we could, um, we could serve food and drink down there, that, you know, that would be fabulous. But so that people can really experience that kind of dichotomy of, um, you know, the above ground, below ground experience, we try and um, partner with some lovely locations around Mayfair. Um, so that people could have a post-tour cocktail or something to eat or some, some lunch. Um, and we've got some lovely partnerships with venues in Mayfair um, where people can do the tour and then go and enjoy some food and drink and just kind of really digest what they've just been through, what they've experienced, what they've learned. Um, we give people a booklet at the end of the tour uh, and we get a lot of feedback that people who do buy the kind of package tour uh, will go off and kind of have their cocktail and their food and look through that booklet and really just extend that experience a little bit more. So that's great for us to know that, that people enjoy that. We say you want to wash your hands before you eat or drink anything because it's filthy <laughs> down there. Although actually, I have to say, Sidi, your first picture in this slideshow, which I adore, because you know me, I'm a bit of a tile fiend. Um, okay. Those tiles are looking remarkably fresh and clean. Well, those are very close to, oh, sorry. Those are close to the um, 
the the entrance into Down Street. So maybe they're, they're kept a little bit tidier than some others. Plus, obviously, the closer you get to the trains, uh, the more du dust you're going to get, just simply because it's going to be, you know, blowing some 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 dust off the off the off the rails. But this is uh, a stenciled tile that is just by the entrance of Down uh, of Down Street, um, and it's reminiscent to the one I showed you uh, a couple of episodes ago. With yeah. Karen Cross, you remember that one? That was an S, wasn't it, at Charing Cross? It was an S. Now this is a G. And we are still kind of uh, unsure why that is. So again, throwing it up to our viewers, if anyone does have an idea of what these stencil tiles mean, do give us a note below. We, and it's a good, have... uh, a good point as well, by the way, Sidi, just to say that um, in the course of doing this, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Then you'll find out exactly when the next episode's coming up. And right below this film is an opportunity for you to leave your comments. And if you've got any idea as to what that S could have meant at Charing Cross, or this G at Down Street. We need to know because I don't know, and not even the experts from the Transport Museum know. So what are, what do these letters mean? G at Down Street, S at Charing Cross. There are others as well, which I'm sure we'll find on our travels. But if you know, drop a note or even suggestions. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, exactly. So it's one of the mysteries and that's what's, what makes this start, this job so fun. You know, what we essentially get to do uh, is something sort of like almost, you know, archaeology of the recent past. It's sort of industrial archaeology. We get to go into these spaces and try to discover what happened there and, you know, who used it and whatnot. So it's, it's a real gem. And, and just another one of those is... Uh, oh, is, yes. You're spoiling me now. You're spoiling <laughs> me now. Simpsons, no. one of the one of the firms that made well tiles for so many tube stations in London. Exactly, Chris. Do you want to tell us a bit about Simpson and Sons? Yeah. So, um, where you get these these tiles, they're commonly known as as makers tiles. Um, they don't survive in in many places, uh, and you'll have. Um, in, in the case of the Simpsons ones, you'll have the supplier's name, which is Simpsons, and then the people who made them, Moores, on, on the right there. And Down Street um, is really lucky, it has a pair of them, and they're often in the lift shaft entrances uh, in, in, these, um, in the stations where they do survive. Beautiful. Yeah. Next now, one, Silly. Now, one more. You know how the entire site was converted? There's still a little bit of uh, Down Street's original pattern that survives in an old signal room just off the end of the platform. Wow. You can see it there. It's beautiful. Uh, it's so, so pretty. How could you not be completely in love with tiles on the tube? I know. Well, just tiles in general. Every time I yeah. see it you know, an old facade tiles or something like that, you know, old Victorian pubs really just gets sort of, I, I really love it. Now, near to the end, just to give you a sense of how narrow it can be down there, that's what the corridors are, are like when you're walking through Down Street. They're quite narrow. So you couldn't even put your arms out, could you? Look at that, that is so tight. You, you probably couldn't even put your elbows out, could you? No, they say that the width of the corridor was around two feet, or exactly the, uh, or, or, or exactly to fit the uh, a civil service tea cart. Um, wow. Whether that's the truth or not uh, remains to be found out. Uh, and there we have one of the <sighs> other corridors. I just, I just sigh with delight seeing these. Look at these, those dimly lit beautiful corridors full of delicious tiles. It's almost worth getting dirty just to see them. <laughs> yes, just this oh, nice. <laughs> Yeah, speaking Cindy, of can dirty. We just go back? Cindy, <laughs> can we just go back to that slide? Yeah. So, um, Alex, it's worth saying that uh, the Railway Executive Committee had a very special guest uh, staying down there. Uh, Winston Churchill needed to take refuge uh, during the autumn of 1940 and into the winter of 1940 during the Blitz when number 10 Downing Street had been uh, badly damaged in a couple of near misses and um, so they, they put up uh, Winston Churchill over a period of about 40 nights, he stayed there about eight or nine nights, uh, discovered the cellars, enjoyed the place uh, and did some very important diplomacy down there. He also commissioned the last spare bit of it for his own use as a bunker, and that corridor 
is where that was put. Uh, now that's quite a big topic and it's one that I would suggest that we come back and do fully on a future occasion but that corridor That's beautiful. And, do you think he took a J-cloth and wiped the walls down? <laughs> <laughs> I doubt he did it. <laughs> Amazing well, stuff. Exactly and there, there you have Down Street today and you can just about see the we took there are the boards that are now blocking the entry uh, blocking the station name uh, we took those down in 2016. You can just see it's yeah. its own street station. Uh, and that's what it looks like today. We are so lucky to have these things still in London. Honestly, every street that you walk up and down, we, you never know what you're going to see. It's what I love about this city. And um, Down Street is a, an, an interesting sort of what happened then, because after the war finished in 1945, the Railway Executive Committee kept meeting in Down Street, didn't it? Until nationalisation in 1948, where, where the national railways effectively were created. Is that right, Chris? It is, yeah. Um, they got all the equipment down there. The, rail, the railways were still being governed uh, under wartime powers. Uh, and yeah, it wasn't until uh, 1st of January 1948 that uh, the Railway Executive Committee fully uh, moved out of using Down Street as their headquarters. Just imagine this, this set of offices in a converted tube station where you have your own railway to drop you off and pick you up. You have so many telephone lines coming in and out that you can run a country. You've got booze down there, you've got food down there, you've got beds down there, you've got loos down there. It's all there. Down Street was command and control. It is just mind-blowing what happened in that place, um, especially at a time of great international crisis. And um, Laura, I love getting your experiences of these things. And um, there must be a favorite moment of your time down there that, I don't know, people you've met, things you've seen, things you've felt. Absolutely, Do you know, your questions are brilliant. That's a fantastic question. Um, a favorite moment must be on one of my first visits down there. Um, and I don't think I was able to take in the enormity um, of where I was about to go and what we would actually see and feel when we got down there. And there's a moment, and I think um, everyone that's been down there will, will hopefully agree, you, you, you kind of descend the original set of staircases um, and then kind of take another set down and you find yourself between the live west and eastbound Piccadilly line. And the trains are just going past you either way and there's a, you know a rush of draft you, you can feel the light um, from you can see the lights coming through and I think it's kind of one of those pinch moments where you're like god we're actually able to work down here and bring members of the public down to experience this and what's really good is if you go down during rush hour when the trains are slightly slower because it's busier and you stand right next to the um, kind of fencing that separates you between uh, the, 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 the track and, and where you are and people just catch a little glimpse of you as they go past and you can see them they, you know literally take a double take at you because they, they know they've seen something, but they're kind of, surely I haven't just seen a person. And there's some really lovely moments of when that's happened when we've been down there. And so whenever I'm on the east or westbound Piccadilly line now, I always have like a little look to see if we're delivering any tours or if I can see anybody behind that kind of corrugated fence. It's so lovely. I, I love being down there. It's, it's a place where you could feel, you could imagine you might feel a bit scared, but actually it's su it feels such a safe, pleasurable environment to be in yeah it's mucky but it's just a really cool bit of london it's like the secret place where all the decisions were made and you get to go down there with a torch and you know a cloth for your face it's absolutely fantastic and um, thank you so much for that gallop around down street team that was fantastic i just want to say thank you so much to sam because we only had sam supposed to have him for about 20 minutes he stayed for 40 so thank you so much sam and um, come back again another time yeah I'd love to, yeah. And um, I think Down Street's the best. It's the kind of grittiest, crunchiest tour we've got. Uh, and for me, it, the moment is that when you first realise that the train's going past the other side of the wall, you know, Laura's moment. It's it's fantastic tour. It's great stuff. Beautifully brought to life by uh, Chris, City and Co. So thank you, Alex. Nice to be here. Uh, 
Um, lovely to meet you too. I think the boss likes you guys. I think this is all right. I think you're all right for a bit longer in the contracts. Yeah. We're all right. Thank goodness for that. Sam Mullins OBE. My goodness, we have first guest on the Hidden London Hangout. This is amazing. Uh, right, okay, so we've got a, a notes and queries, as we do. We sometimes do questions, sometimes do notes and queries. And we've got a few bits and pieces to cover. First of all, um, on Facebook, uh, a lovely gentleman called David Earl said, did you know that the Alderney Railway in the Channel Islands has a tube train on it? And yes, I can tell you this because we've got a photograph of it and uh, City will find that for us. Um, it is a 1959 stock train from the Northern Line and it was painted up in a certain livery to mark a hundred years of the Northern Line back in 1990. And there it is sitting there on Alderney. It doesn't run on its own. It's not run by electric. It's actually pushed along by a shunter. It still says Collindale. Look at that. That's amazing. And uh, as I say, it dates from 1959. And um, in its time running around the tube, it could have been on the Piccadilly line. It certainly ended up on the Northern line. And uh, I've used that train many, many times when it was uh, in passenger service. And um, I must go to Alderney, actually, because I'm a bit of a train geek. I do like the trains. And many, many times I've tried to convince Chris to get one of these 1959 stock for the museum. But I've not yet managed to persuade you, have I, Chris, yet? Uh, not yet, no. Uh, the trouble with big things is that you need the space to put them in. <laughs> it's always the way, isn't it, really? While we're on the subject, Chris, um, there was another question about Moquette from last week, and we, we left a dangler, didn't we? We did indeed, yes. And I, I have, uh, there, were, there were two samples which I didn't have in my uh, sizable stock of Moquette in the, in the shed. Um, the first of which was uh, lozenge. Uh, I described it as being kind of beige with a nice teal bar in it. And there you go. That's beautiful. That's, I love that. That's called lozenge, that, right? That's called lozenge. And that was used on both tube trains and buses in the 20s. So our K-type bus has got it. Uh, if you want to see it actually on a vehicle, uh, when we reopen the museum depot at Acton, we have, uh, we have that. Now, I, correct me if I'm wrong, okay? I may be wrong. And below, you can tell me I'm wrong, but I think that train that was decorated for, or that ended up on Alderney, I think the seating was done out in lozenge. So it was red and cream on the outside with a silver roof. And I think the, the seats were done in lozenge with green paintwork. I may be wrong, and I'm prepared to be wrong, but I think that is what they did it out in. Because I remember at the time thinking, this is a stunning train. Could, could oh, well be. So uh, sad. So sad. <laughs> no, it's, it's marvellous. It's marvellous. And the, the, the second one that I have to show you um, uh, was the B-type maquette, which is the one I was saying might, might be the contender for being the earlier one. Now, this is a sample which I got um, uh, several years ago now when we were fundraising to restore the B-type bus that is called Battle Bus. And as a thank you for taking part in the crowdsourcing, uh, I was sent a sample of the seat fabric so there you go so that's b type uh b type maquette oh that's lovely it's, it's almost tudor-esque isn't it it's got like a tudor rose in it or something hold on city you're not supposed to like maquette how come you've got excited oh We're no I, it's slowly seeping it, it's it's happening guys you're managing to convert me <laughs> loving I this need... love a conversion i know I love it. And um, I gather, Chris, as well, that our um, tentacles, careful, Alex, what you say, our tentacles are extending down under with um, our fans of this little hangout that we do every week. Uh, indeed, yes. Uh, we have uh, at least one follower in uh, Sydney, uh, in Australia, um, uh, which I think is our furthest flung so far. Um, and um, I'd just like to say a shout out to Wollongong, where I lived very briefly when I was a, a small child, uh, which is uh, just on the outskirts of, of Sydney. So uh, nice to know that we've got uh, a following developing around the world. Uh, shout you, out to you, Greta Log. Who, so uh, you were big in Wollongong? I, I was only four. Right. I was quite little. We must leave it. Uh, Laura, by the way, I've got something to say to you. There is, I'm not going to mention them by name. However, there is somebody who pointed out that uh, Chris, Siddy and I perhaps stole the limelight in the last edition and, um, and that you were neglected. And I just want to double check. Do, do you feel that we've neglected you this time? Oh, bless. That's very sweet, whoever, um, whoever did say that. Thank you. Um, so no, I've got I the number. I I've got the number. I I'll put them in touch. 
I didn't feel that at all. Um, I think I think what's really important is we all just get really excited when you kind of give us a question or an opening. And so we all kind of just run with it. And sometimes we go a little bit over the, our alleged or allotted time. And so that happens. And I just sit and I listen and I, and I love listening to you guys as well. So. Well, I loved last week when we were talking about um, Moquette, I loved the point where you, it looked like you banged on the glass to get attention. It was just wonderful. It's like, I was so knock, knock, knock. excited. I, I was it. so excited that you even had a cushion of my favourite Moquette and that I knew what these four hidden landmarks were. I, just, I thought that was fabulous. Um, but actually, what you said something about Down Street before about it being um, a kind of very safe and secure space. And it just made me think that actually, you know, it, it, it's such a special place. And I didn't mention this before, and I think um, what's really important is when, when we do the tours and we go down there, there's so much kind of decoding that the, um, that the audience can get involved in because of the witness marks and the kind of complex layout of the, of the tour. Um, and I just wanted to say that because I think it's, it's something that really makes it stand out from, you know, some of the other venues that we do, that we do look around and makes it super special. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for being part of it as always, Laurie. You're, ama you're amazing. I love you dearly. And um, thank you so much to Siddy as well. Thank you, darling. Thank you. Thank you very much. A pleasure as always. And uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, darling. Has he, Has gone? he gone? He's left. <laughs> He's left the building. Do you know, <laughs> that's gratitude for you, isn't it? Honestly. <laughs> God blimey, the last time I call you, darling. Uh, well, anyway, thank you very much indeed for you being part of it as well. Don't forget, keep making your comments at the bottom. All right, we want to make sure that we get loads of comments. Anything you want to say to us, do tell us. Uh, follow and subscribe LT Museum on YouTube. This is the thing that you're watching it on now. Also follow them on uh, Instagram as well. You can follow Chris Nix, you can follow Siddy Holloway, and you can follow me, Alex Grunton, on Instagram as well. And I promise in a week's time, we'll be back exploring somewhere down, dirty, filthy, and fabulous. So have yourself a great day and stay safe.